unfortunately, I have um, inclusion body myositis, which is IBM, and it's it's a long. I've had it a long time. It's very slow moving, but it is a, a degenerative muscle disease. Peter Frampton may be the most famous person that we know today with IBM, inclusion body myositis, but he is far from the only one. Good morning. It's Wednesday, November the 30th. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, and this is Open Mics with Dr. Stites. You know, Peter Frampton surprised the world in 2019 when he announced he was canceling a tour because of a muscle-wasting disease called inclusion body myositis, IBM. Although considered an uncommon condition, millions of people are living with IBM, and we're going to meet one of the patients today, along with her physician, as we help explain this complex disease. Our patient is Jill Sonker. Pretty good, I think I said it right. Diagnosed with IBM in 2012. Jill, welcome and thank you for being willing to share part of your story today. We also welcome Jill's right. doctor. I'm happy to be here. You bet, thank you. Mazen Domachki. I know Mazen very well. He's the director of our neuromuscular division here at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He is a brilliant researcher who's also a brilliant neurologist. Clinical neurophysiology and neuromuscular medicine, that's his, well, that's his realm here at the University of Kansas Health System. We are delighted to have him on our program today as well. And of course, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, everybody says it correctly now, Hawkeye to me, Hawkeye. Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, will join us shortly with a look at the trifecta of flu RSV and COVID viruses. We'll have a conversation about where we're headed on each of these, yeah. some more concerning than others now. Yeah. So inclusion body myositis or IBM is a progressive muscle wasting or weakening disease. It typically weakens the muscles of your hip and finger flexors first. That's a funny one, hip and finger flexors. Explain that one to me. Now that's a big concern for Peter Frampton who played the guitar. Myositis means inflammation, and it can trigger a lot of weakness. Dr. Domachki, what does inclusion body mean in the context of this disease, and why, why this thing about hips and the tips of my fingers? Sure. Uh, first, uh, good morning, everyone, <coughs> and hello, and thank you, Jill, for joining us to raise awareness about this rare disease, inclusion body myositis. Um, I think that the term inclusion body got integrated within the disease R roughly half a century ago with the f description of the first case, which was not quite typical, but the first case had what's called inclusion buddies. And what that means is this young man who had weakness in their arms and legs, uh, when they underwent a muscle biopsy, under the microscope it showed a couple of things in addition to inflammation. One of them was holes inside the muscle fibers called vacuoles. And in addition to that, it showed in the muscle cell body called cytoplasm, uh, eosinophilic inclusions, which are pinkish looking inclusions uh, that are in the cytoplasm. And therefore, the term inclusion body myositis took off from there on. And we use this to distinguish inclusion body myositis, this finding on the microscope, from other forms of myositis. Polymyositis and dermatomyositis specifically don't have those inclusions, don't have the vacuoles. So, Dr. Mashke, your, your um, uh, I, IBM can also cause dysphagia or difficulty in swallowing. Um, your research has shown that 50 to 70 percent of IBM patients complained of trouble swallowing. Now, as a lung doctor, I know that's really bad news because when people start getting trouble swallowing, it means they can swallow stuff into their lungs. They can choke on it. They have trouble breathing. They can die. And so this is a big deal, a serious problem. Tell us a little bit more about that symptom of IBM. And I'll uh, answer that question here shortly, and I may have failed to answer the second part of your first question. I was getting which back to the fingers. About the the fingers. I'm getting back yes. to fingers and fingers and <laughs> hips. Don't worry. So you start okay. with that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start with the fingers. So when it comes to the other forms of myositis, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, the muscles that are involved are around the shoulder. Uh, joints around the hip joints, meaning patients have trouble getting up from a chair, they have trouble reaching up with their arms. However, the pattern of involvement in inclusion body myositis is quite different and distinctive in the sense that for the doctor seeing the patient in the clinic the first time that are still not yet diagnosed, seeing that pattern of finger flexion being weak and seeing the pattern whereby the thigh muscle, the quadriceps muscle is also weakened uh, is very helpful. So the type of symptoms that patients will elicit 
I'm dropping things from my hands, my grip is getting weaker, um, or I'm buckling at the knees and falling. And when I hear that in the clinic, that tells me in all likelihood it's not polymyositis or dermatomyositis, but it's more likely to be inclusion body myositis. Now, there are additional diagnostic tests that need to take place, but by that point in time, I'm not suspecting uh, other diseases. So it's a helpful clue the question as to the why. That's you know, a big why? question. Why? Exactly. And then nobody knows why. And one day well, someone why, will discover why, why so. <laughs> and they'll get the Nobel Prize for discovering the why okay. for this. So we can't tell we can't tell Peter why it landed in his fingers, it just did. And it's a funny one. So talk to us a little bit more about this trouble because the trouble swallowing, that's a big deal. Um, that can really get patients into trouble. Absolutely. As you know, swallowing is important not only for your nutrition, but for your hydration. So not swallowing well can compromise both. And it's important to maintain a good nutrition, good hydration overall, but specifically with IBM. While there's no specific diet component that one can recommend, maintaining a stable body weight uh, is quite important, except if someone is a little bit overweight, it makes sense to lose some weight. What we found is that most patients with IBM early on and throughout the course of their disease will develop a dysfunction of those muscles that are red skeletal muscles that control the upper esophagus called pharyngeal muscles as well as the upper part of the esophagus, the upper third, that are red skeletal muscle fibers are impaired in people with IBM. Not only that, we found that even before the muscle strength is affected in the arms and legs, in one out of six IBM patients, they may have swallowing problems for years or even a decade before they move on to develop the full typical picture of inclusion body myositis. So that esophagus, we have to remember, it's a muscle, folks. And the way the esophagus works, you take a swallow, and your, your esophagus contracts to push that food. It doesn't just happen by gravity. The, the esophagus is a muscle. When that muscle doesn't work right, the food doesn't move right. When it doesn't move right, it can get stuck there. And then you can start choking on things and get stuck in the back of your throat, back in what we call the pharynx. And so the esophagus and the pharynx, big deals. And when they don't work right, that's a challenge to us. So this, this is a neurodegenerative disorder. Now, we're gonna talk about that a little bit because we're gonna have to, that's a big word, that neurodegenerative thing. So if you split the word in a half, neuro means your brain and your spinal cord and your nerves. Degenerative means it's breaking down a little bit. In IBM, is it your brain cells or the nerve cells in your body that are breaking down? Well, thank you very much for this interesting question. Uh, when we look at the term neurodegenerative uh, in IBM, uh, we're thinking of neuro and degenerative. So neuro part is nervous system. Now, this is a crash course for first year medical students about nervous system and for the mm -hmm. audience here that there is a central nervous system component, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and there's a peripheral nervous system component that originates from the nerve cells in the spinal cord called anterior horn cells through the peripheral nerve into the nerve muscle junction and into the muscle itself. And so the, when we talk about neuro, we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, more specifically the muscle itself being affected, not so much so the brain. The brain luckily is spared in people with IBM. Now the degenerative part of it comes from the fact that while there is inflammation in IBM, uh, attempts to treat patients with IBM with anti-inflammatory methods have so far failed, but hopefully they'll succeed in the future, but so far they failed, and there are deposits in the muscle tissue itself of amyloid and other proteins that are being associated with degenerative diseases that led to the theory that perhaps it's resistant to treatment, to anti-inflammatory treatment, there are degenerative findings in the muscle fiber, there are protein aggregates, therefore it must be in part a neurodegenerative disease, but it's a very complex disease. Mm. That's an oversimplification. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to, well, this is not something that simplifies very easily, so <laughs> it, I think you've done a great job of trying to explain that. Now, you, you, you've talked before, we've talked a little bit that, about autoimmune diseases, kind of when the body's own immune system ta starts to attack itself. Tell us what causes IBM and what's the role of an autoimmune disease in IBM? Is it always present? Is it always something like, well, really you have IBM because you have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or is it separate? And so let's start with what causes IBM? Right. 
So that's the million dollar question, or 10 or 20 or 30 million dollar question as to what causes IBM. The quick answer is we don't know. We know of some associations. Uh, HLA is part of your immune makeup, and there are some HLA haplotypes that are part of your genes that control immunity that have been associated with more likelihood of developing inclusion body myositis. However, when it comes to associated autoimmune diseases that are outside the IBM itself, the most common one is uh, Sjogren's syndrome. There are others that are much less common, like systemic lupus erythematosus, sarcoidosis, uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia that have been described with inclusion body myositis. Clearly, by far, the most common is Sjogren's syndrome. Again, keep in mind that the majority of IBM patients do not have an associated autoimmune disorder. And this is one of those times in medicine where we struggle as physicians because we can't really explain things to a patient. And we all want to explain, hey, this is what's caused your disease and here's our answer of what to do. Too often what we do is we say, okay, well here are the findings. We've lumped all those findings together. We call it this. But because it's caused by different things, the therapies have to be different because we don't really understand your disease very well. And I think that's kind of what I'm hearing. This is, I, IBM is sort of this manifestation of several different, it could be your genetic problem, it could be another disease problem, it could be something we don't know. There's just a lot to learn here, isn't there? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that makes it so a bit challenging. Well, now you test creatinine kinase, what we call CK levels. And that's just a, an enzyme that's released by our muscles. It's a protein, and it can signal when it's really high. It can signal you have a heart attack or a muscle injury or even a brain injury, depending on what part. Dr. Bashke, how do you know when elevated CK levels mean that it's an IBM, or how do you diagnose IBM? Right. So uh, the elevation in creatine kinase in IBM is not really specific to IBM. It can occur in any muscle disease. There are some genetic muscle disorders, acquired muscle disorders that can have this elevation of CK. So it doesn't tell us specifically that this is the one diagnosis, but it puts us in the ballpark of a muscle disease. Obviously, when people hear an elevated muscle enzyme, one of the things they worry about is the heart. The heart is not affected in IBM, and the symptoms of a heart attack are quite dramatically different from those of having inclusion body myositis. Yep. Patients with IBM don't come with acute chest pain, acute shortness of breath, right. uh, radiating arm pain, nausea and vomiting like a heart attack does. And also there are some fractions of the CK, like the CKMB, which is not elevated in patients with IBM, which is more specific towards the heart, and that's helpful. But generally speaking, CK is one of the clues. This muscle enzyme leaking from destroyed muscle fibers uh, is one of the clues to tell us that this is in the ballpark of IBM, keeping in mind that 20% of patients with IBM will have muscle disease, but yet a normal CK because of advanced muscle wasting. Wow, so this is so darn complicated. And, and um, do you think this is an underdiagnosed disease? Actually, there's more of it out there than people know because it's I, kind of. Absolutely, absolutely. The answer is yes. I think there's a delay in diagnosis of about seven years mm -hmm. from the beginning to the diagnosis. And the part of the issue is that this disease typically affects people that are over age 40, typically over age 60. Careful, and, uh, you looked right at me for that mm -hmm. one. Well, I, was, and I, I got I, that look. Or, or I'm looking in the mirror too. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, the, the, the thing about it is that it affects people of certain age whereby we have joint issues that develop around that time. I'm not talking about you, Steve, here, but just generally speaking. <laughs> it is uh, true, though. And, and, and there are other issues that develop, and so the primary care physician typically dismisses this as part of normal aging process. You're a bit weaker in your hands. You have arthritis in your hands. Your, your knee is buckling. Well, you may have some osteoarthritis in your knee. So it's dismissed, unrecognized. Until then, it becomes more full-blown picture than they refer to the neurologist and the neuromuscular specialist that is very capable of recognizing this syndrome, this complex of symptoms that really leads to the diagnosis of inclusion body myositis to the proper workup. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. I, I want to bring in Jill Sonker. Jill, uh, tell us a little bit how you were diagnosed and what was going on that sent you to the doctor. <coughs> Sorry. You may be, Just there you go. Just um, as Dr. Demochke was um, indicating it, it probably took 10 years of visiting different doctors to actually figure out what was going on with me. I um, started uh, 
not being able to take the stairs very easily. And I had always been a very strong athletic um, person. And this was like very weird not to be able to go up steps. Eventually I was going one step at a time and, you know, have to use the railing to get myself up. Then it was um, uh, falling. I fell all the time for no apparent reason. I mean, I could trip over nothing on a sidewalk. And, um, and that was weird. And so I began going to doctors. And what happens then when you do that is they end up treating your, your, um, your injuries because I had many injuries, knees, um, neck, face. I had to go to the hospital a couple of times for stitches. Um, so you concentrate on treating that and nobody actually looks into why it is happening to you, which, is, which can be very frustrating. But as we've learned over the years, that it's not an uncommon uh, for this type of um, disease to have a diagnosis that takes this long. Um, I was um, going to my chiropractor who, who had been noticing I kept coming in because of my falls and she said, I think there's something that we need to look into here for you having falls, which was the first person that said anything to me about why I was having it. So she contacted my um, uh, general practitioner she got me set up for a test for um, muscular dystrophy. I mean, no, no, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, sorry. And um, that proved that I did not have MS, but uh, I had something, but we still didn't know what it was. She then sent me to uh, Dr. Gordon Kelly, uh, who is a um, neurologist in Shawnee Mission. And he um, gave me all the proper tests and um, was still having problems figuring out what was wrong until, and this is very important for other doctors to hear and to understand, I was getting up from my chair at the end of my exam and I had to use both hands and had to cross my ankles and hoist myself up, which was the only way I could get out of the chair at that point. And he looked at me and went, whoa, sit down and do that again. So I sat down and he says, now do it without using your hands. And I said, there's, there's no way I can get up without using my hands. So then he put me back on the exam table and did a few other tests and uh, asked me to uh, lift my head. I was laying flat on my back, lift my head. And so I automatically went like this to lift my head. He says, no, don't, don't use your hands. And I could not lift my head without using my hands. Yeah, so tough. these are things that I had just become accustomed to because it'd been, you know, like seven or eight years that I'd been having these, um, um, issues. And just like everybody said, you think that it's, uh, attributed to aging. Um, yeah. so he very kindly said, um, I don't know what you have, but you need to go to KU. And um, he worked at getting me in for an appointment with Dr. Demochki. I went in with Dr. Demochki, and within 30 minutes, he had me diagnosed. Then we did a muscular uh, biopsy, and uh, it proved that I did have um, inclusion body myositis, and that was in 2012. So that, that, that slow progression is pretty typical, Dr. Demajka. Absolutely. And, so, and Jill, how, how are you doing today? Um, I am one of the lucky ones. I'm doing uh, remarkably well, I think, for having been diagnosed for 10 years, which means I had it for six to eight years before then. Also, um, I am able to, um, I'm am ambulatory. I use a walking stick when I'm out in public. Sometimes I use a walker. Um, I have a, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I get brain fog too sometimes. But um, I'm able to get around. I still drive. Um, but many, many, many people that have IBM 
have progressed much quicker than I have. I have a, yeah. um, an acquaintance that um, was diagnosed like a year after me, and he's in a power chair at this point. Wow. So now we understand so you, like you like to travel a lot. Yeah, yeah, we say you like to travel a lot, and we're looking at some of your pictures that you've shared with us. And has this disease affected your ability to get out and do the things you love to do? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have cut all of my uh, travel down to just stateside. Um, I used to, my husband and I traveled extensively, but um, it's just so, and this is another thing that, that needs to be brought up, it's exhausting to travel because you're, you get up and you get down. And as I was describing um, with the uh, getting out of a chair, you have to engage every ounce of muscle that you have left to be able to get up and get down. Right. And um, so it's just a awesome kind of harrowing to go, um, you know, on long flights. So I just have cut my travel down to the, uh, visiting my grandchildren, which are in Maryland and uh, Colorado. All right, so now, Dr. Domachki, what treatments can you do for, for this disease? Yeah, I, I, I believe strongly in patient education. So probably Jill can take that question, but I'm yeah. not gonna put it on the spot. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, in patients uh, that present with inclusion body myositis, uh, sometimes I see uh, people overdoing it when it comes to exercises. So it's important to exercise. It keeps your muscles healthy, we think, for a longer period of time and therefore perhaps slows down the trajectory of inclusion by myositis. Instead of going down like this, maybe it'll flatten it out a little bit. But it's important not to overdo it. So what's not to overdo it is kind of a very subjective term. So we try to make it quantitative. So we talk about what's called mild to moderate intensity, low repetition, uh, non-fatiguing exercises. So mild to moderate intensity means if someone can pick up 10 pounds and do a single contraction of the biceps, for example, can do it, but yet it, when they go to 11 pounds, they cannot do it. 10 pounds is that single maximum contraction. However, you don't do that. You take that number of 10 divided by half. That is mild to moderate intensity. Low repetition means 10 repetitions. You cycle three times through the muscles. And non-fatiguing meaning the next day, there's no experience of fatigue or weakness or jelly-like feeling in the muscles or pain in the muscles, as that indicates destruction of muscle fibers, which have trouble regenerating in IBM. So that's what we recommend. And unfortunately, uh, treatments that are immunosuppressive, that deal with inflammation, treatments that have tried to attempt to deal with uh, the protein aggregates so far have not been successful in IBM. So the treatment mainly is to eat healthy, though we're not sure about what that means exactly, but exercise on a regular basis, commensurate to the health of the muscle fibers themselves. Okay. So you do some, how do you know, how do you know if you're getting worse and you should go get seek and figure out this is what you got, or how is it just normal aging? Like I don't get out of here as easy today as I did 20 years ago. Right. So uh, it's quite different from normal aging because if you uh, look at it closely, people will describe things like, well, when I'm trying to get up from a chair, as Jill indicated, I really have to use my arms to push myself up. Now, if you touch the armrest just for balance, that's different. If you touch the rails going up the steps just for balance, that's different. If you're having to grab the rails to pull yourself up, that's an indication of a muscle weakness, a muscle right. disease, and that would be <coughs> one of the first clues that you're dealing with a disease like IBM so that you don't have to get to wait to the point of debuckling and falling to discover, yes, I have IBM. So hopefully with programs like this, but other educational programs we're doing, we can raise awareness of, with IBM and people can get diagnosed earlier on. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions would be, you're, you do a lot of clinical research and research in general, so what's the research look like in IBM? Well, uh, as far as IBM goes, um, and in general, in neuromuscular disease, I'm proud to share with you that here at KU, we have one of the largest, if not the largest, clinical trials unit in North America. So patients with IBM will have not to go anywhere else but to KU to come uh, for access to clinical trials. So if I look at the last year, this last year, we have six studies in IBM alone that are ranging from completed to started or starting in the way of studies that will help people with IBM. 
So uh, I think participating in research is very important. Uh, there are a lot of exciting uh, studies going on right now. So if you're interested, just reach out. We'll be happy to uh, have you explore your opportunities for research here at KU. Yep. All right, we're going to get to some questions from the community next, and, and see, I want you to send those to us on YouTube, Facebook, the Medical News Network, and now Twitter. The links are on your screen. But first, we're going to check in with Dr. Hawkinson. Doc Hawk, yeah. how are things looking? Well, you know, <clears throat> they're not too good. We wish they could be better, for sure. COVID count right now, we've gone up just a little bit. 27 active infections in the hospital, five in the ICU, you know, which is un uh, unfortunate. One on the ventilator, still uh, 16 in that recovery period as well. So um, just as we had talked about earlier, overall cases um, in the United States have been going up. Um, we know that hospitalizations follow that, but we know right now it seems like our hospital cases are trending up as well. They are trending up. And if we can show the heat map for just a side, can you guys have the heat map? Or yeah. <clears throat> heat map is getting hotter. A few yeah. weeks ago we were looking at this. It had a little bit of stuff down in New Mexico and Arizona. You can see the things starting to sprout up around the country, all the little uh, darker spots. And, and if you look at the uh, different things the New York Times is showing every day, you know, the numbers are clearly rising through the United States. I think it's a lot of the rise of the variants. Yep. At the same time, influenza, influenza is a challenge. Uh, hot, Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I did want to mention, because you did talk about uh, the variants. So right now, probably BQ.1 and BQ.1.1, uh, I believe, are probably the highest proportioned variants around the United States. We know certainly in our community that is increasing as well. Unfortunately, then, what that means is there is probably little to no activity of the anti monoclonal antibody treatment, bevtilovimab, and also likely very little to no activity of the Evusheld monoclonal antibody preventive medication as so well. So those things may not be as helpful with this round of COVID, and that can Absolutely. mean bad things for people with transplants and yep. other things who are more immunosuppressed. So I just, yes. people have to be thoughtful about that. We've said before, look, just go get early treatment. Right now, we don't have early treatment for the for this new variant yeah. and, or new, the new couple of variants. And so that's that's going to be a bit of a challenge yeah. this winter, I'm afraid. That's why getting tested early, we still have activity of the antiviral drugs, remdesivir and Paxlovid. Getting on Paxlovid early, especially if you're in those high risk, is vitally important. But I do have faith in science, and I believe there probably and there will be new monoclonal antibody their uh, prophylactic measures like Evusheld, but also treatment. Ones. Yeah, we'll be able to pivot on them how we make yeah. those, but but right now people are going to be particularly at risk. So yeah. RSV and influenza. Yeah. RSV is trending down, but influenza. Yeah, and influenza is really the major concern here. You know, especially in the latest CDC data. Uh, overall, our seem to be a uh, curve for going up for outpatient uh, visits is increasing compared to the last five or 10 years of influenza. Um, certainly we also know testing is increased at this time point of the year compared to other years as well. We are following that national trend here at the health system. Here's our influenza numbers. And um, if we go back to that purple graph, we will see that it is really a stark uh, image there with just this continued increase in the number of testings that we're doing, and those are at the bottom, uh, but also the number of positive tests and also the number of percent positive tests. It is still climbing. It has not reached its peak yet. That is concerning. The other concerning part about that, if we go to the next slide, is the hospitalizations. And this is showing influenza hospitalizations. This is bad. This is a bad graph. That is a very stark uh, graph of, you know, we had a few and then now it's jumped up. I know yesterday uh, in my consult service in the hospital, I saw two new influenza infections myself. So, And they're here for influenza. Yep. And just to say, I think last week we had 38 admissions with influenza. And we still have more with COVID. We think about, okay, that means we probably had about 20 or 25 patients in the house. And you mm -hmm. had 43 COVID. Suddenly you're at 68. Yeah. And then you have four or five RSV. Suddenly you're at 70, 75 patients. That's about 8% of our overall census now. And you may be even higher, as much as 10% is here because of RSV, COVID, or influenza. That's a yeah. big percentage. Yeah, and you know, that is coupled with the fact that I believe we are getting into or into a shortage of Tamiflu around the nation as well. Yeah. That is the oral antiviral used to treat influenza. But um, from the latest genomic data, there does seem to be a fairly good match of the current circulating viruses, the H1N1 
and the H3N2 influenza A viruses with those components of the vaccine. So that is good news. People really do knock on the vaccine a lot saying, oh, it, it doesn't work very well. Typically in a year, it has 30 to 50% uh, reduction in your chance of hospitalization. It's probably more about that 50% uh, at this point in time, but we need to wait to the interim analysis, which is usually done in January. But still, if you can get a 30 to 50% chance of you going to the hospital. Reduce that chance, that's a with, big deal. With very yeah. minimal side effects, go get the vaccine if you haven't gotten well, it Well, and I think there's a little bit of fear because so far this year, we haven't seen as much uptake of the influenza vaccine. Yeah. It's like we're still in this post-COVID haze. And, and again, for some reason, people still want to believe they don't work or they're going to cause terrible harm to our body. A, they absolutely do work, both COVID and influenza. B, they do not cause terrible harm to your body. C, watch the numbers go up and it's going to be repeated last winter when people started to get a little panic because our numbers are going up and and hopefully they'll level off hopefully you yeah. know enough vaccinations out there and we still got Pla uh, paxlovid and things like that but i think in vulnerable populations you are more vulnerable right now because of the failure of avia and yeah. the monoclonals and I, I think you know um so covid and influenza probably not very good right now covid getting worse we know influenza is still on the uptick and it is fairly high activity around the nation. If we go to our RSV cases, um, I think this is good news. You know, looking at the national data, it really seemed to peak as far as number of antigen and PCR tests, which this is our data for the health system. It really did seem to peak around the week of November 5th and has come down. This is kind of what we're seeing here as well with our antigen and PCR tests, both inpatient and outpatient testing. We did kind of see a peak, it's going down. Also the number of in, uh, RSV uh, admissions is down quite a bit as well from what it was a couple weeks ago. So yeah, hopefully we've seen a peak and continued downtrend on that. And our, our testing positivity rate for RSV is down in the 8 to 10 percent range, but the influenza testing, yeah. that means the number of tests we take, how many of them are positive for influenza, around 25 to 30 percent. Yeah. That's a very high percentage. Quite a bit. And so again, these are these are just challenges we have. And, and so the, the real thing is if you're sick, wear a mask. If you're going to go out in public, uh, and you're sick, please don't do that. Uh, stay yeah. home. Uh, and, 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 and if you do, just make sure you have a mask on so you don't make people sick around you. And, and uh, it is, you know, the numbers going up, and I think the next couple of months could be a little bit bumpy, and we'll see how much of a bump it is. Jill. Hmm. Yes. Questions. Jill, wake up. Hello. Good morning. Oh, Hello. I'm, I'm here. Wait, you mean Jess. Yeah. Oh, God, I did that again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Sorry, Jill. No, I was actually talking Jess to Jess, but I got Jill. confused because I got a Jess and Jill on the phone. Sorry, or on the line today. Okay, I will handle, don't make Jill ask the questions today. I will handle those, Jill. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, and I'll have one for you here in just a moment, so stand by. But the first question is, IBM seems to share many symptoms with my, myasthenia gravis. Uh, what are similar treatments between the two, or are there? Uh, while there are surface similarities between myasthenia gravis and inclusion body myositis, there are some distinctive differences, meaning that uh, people who have myasthenia gravis have some things that IBM patients don't have, like double vision, eye muscle weakness, a droopiness in the eyelid is not a common symptom of inclusion, uh, of, uh, inclusion body myositis. Uh, respiratory compromise or crisis is not part of inclusion body myositis. There are certain antibodies on blood testing that are present in the majority of people with uh, myasthenia gravis that don't exist in people with uh, inclusion body uh, myositis. Therefore, uh, myasthenia gravis and myositis on the surface can be similar but are quite fundamentally different. We understand the pathogenesis or the cause of uh, myasthenia gravis to be antibody mediated. We don't fully understand the cause of IBM. Therefore, the therapies that work very well for myasthenia gravis, and there are many novel therapies that have come out in the last couple of years, uh, those have not been tested in IBM, and I'm not sure how well as a prediction they would work in IBM given the lack of uh, full understanding of what is the chicken and what is the egg. Is it the immunity or is it the degeneration or is it both? All right. Jess? Uh, Martin wants to know, Jill, if this runs in your family. Had you ever heard of IBM before? No, never. And um, it hasn't run in my family. Um, it this just started with me and we hope it ends with me. Um, yeah, it's, 
I'll take I'll take take it for the team. Yeah, but, Muslim uh, is it I tend to be a genetic? I wouldn't wish it on Sorry. anybody. Yeah. Right. Does it uh, tend to be ge genetic? There is a condition called hereditary inclusion body myopathy, that's totally different and separate from inclusion body myositis, and that is like less than one percent of people who have this phenotype of inclusion body myositis may have that, but we're able to clearly distinguish that phenotypically, meaning the weakness pattern is quite different and distinctive, so that, yes, there is something of a genetic variant, but the majority, 99% plus of the cases, are sporadic, they're not transmitted from generation to generation. I, I think what this means, Mazin, is we gotta teach neurologists how to do a better job in naming things so they don't make mm. them so darn confusing all the time. <laughs> Angela wants to know, can any medications lead to IBM? Uh, medications do not uh, trigger inclusion body myositis. Yeah, they, this whole thing about how the disease was with that, those um, uh, amyloid uh, uh, proteins, things inside the cells, that's not a result of a medication. That's a no. disease process in the body, yeah. And a question for Jill is from Sandra. She wants to know how your lifestyle, maybe um, your physical activity or your diet, has any of that changed um, due to this diagnosis? Well, my lifestyle has changed dramatically because um, I, it, the minute I walk into a new environment, I, I initially scope it out and see where I can sit or if I can sit because most places, even wonderful doctor's offices, the KU, have lower chairs. And um, I will spend lots of time just standing because I cannot get up without assistance. Um, I'm trying to think, let's see what else. Uh, it, all sorts of things um, are affected uh, by just not being able to get in or out of a vehicle like I, I can't get out of a, a sedan, say. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to ride in a, a SUV or a, a minivan. Um, just little things like that. You just have to take into consideration whenever you go anywhere or do anything that this is something that you have to um, be concerned with. Jill, another question is, you know, when people have a diagnosis like this that comes out of the blue, you never even heard of it, you have this very active lifestyle, a lot of times it's hard to kind of keep mentally sound um, when you're going through a diagnosis. What advice do you have for people that, um, you know, that are taking care of their mental health as they're, as they're also trying to take care of their physical health when something like this occurs? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I found very helpful was being diagnosed. It was like finding out what in the world is going on with my body and why are these things happening to me. Once you have, you know, knowledge is power. Once you have that, then I was able to eventually um, stop falling so often because I knew my body was fatigued and that eventually was going to happen if I kept pushing myself. Uh, another is I realized at a certain point that I needed um, help. I had a, um, I'm on an antidepressant um, right now, and that has been remarkably um, helpful for me. Um, I also just have a positive attitude about things, and I'm thrilled that I have stumbled across Dr. Demochki and his whole crew, and I feel like I, I won the lottery um, by being able to get into KU. I've been in uh, two or three studies that he's had, and I love just being involved and uh, finding out what's going on and, and um, you know, just being informed, I think, is part of it. Yes, but your, your positive attitude speaks volumes. I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, Dr. Seitz, that's it for me for questions from the well, community. I, I'll send I, it back to you. Yeah, I got a, Jill, are you having trouble swallowing? Yes, I am. I've had three, uh, oh, help me with the pronunciation. The esophageal um, dilation. Uh, the di dilation. Dilation of your yes. esophagus because of scarring, yeah. Yes, I've had that done three times. Um, uh, and, you know, I can probably have it done again, but um, it has, this last one really did help. And Dr. Samo at um, KU took care of that, and he's just been 
very supportive and really interested in why this is happening and, and, and curious. And that's what I would ask for healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, whomever, be curious about why somebody is going through something um, that, that you don't understand because it could be something um, that you've never heard of and hopefully you've heard of it now, today, and you'll be able to diagnose some more people. Jill, you're, you're a star. You have to come back on the program and talk to us about how to deal with uh, chronic illness because I think you've just been just, uh, you've done a wonderful job. You've really helped light up this question for us and, and your response. And Dr. Majki, is this shorten life, this disease? Uh, it does not necessarily shorten life. Uh, there have been different studies that have looked at mortality. The one from the Netherlands suggested a small change in survival. However, what this disease does primarily to you is, it, let's face it, you become over time more and more dependent on others to do things like cutting food for yourself becomes difficult, buttoning buttons, doing zippers become difficult, um, walking becomes a chore. Sometimes people have to go on to the depressing reality of needing a wheelchair for mobility. Uh, it's, it's like ALS, everybody knows ALS, have heard yes. of ALS uh, with the ice water bucket uh, challenge. So people know about that. It's like slow ALS, that's how you think of it. Even though the pathway of the nervous system where it's affected is different, it's kind of this type of disease that's disabling slowly over time. And we need to find something that really changes the trajectory of the disease and I'm very thankful to Jill coming here today to raise awareness but also to her volunteering to donate her time to be part of research and all our research volunteers that help us with our success in completing studies, finding out whether treatments do work for IBM and will continue on this path until we succeed. This has been a great program today. You guys have just been the best of guests. So I want to get final thoughts today. Jill, first of all, uh, uh, thank you again for being on here and, and final thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with today. I just want, as I just stated, I want for more medical personnel to be aware that there is this disease that's out there. And although we there isn't a treatment for it at this point, being knowledgeable about what is happening to your patient and what they're going through is, you know, extremely valuable. And it, it can help, you know, in, I mean, if I hadn't known that I had IBM, I would not have picked up on why, why am I having problems swallowing so much? Uh, I had the Heimlich maneuver done on me because I had choked and, you know, on hardly anything. So it's just be curious, ask your patients um, a, a series of questions to bring them out because they're scared when they go in to talk to you and they forget half of what they wanted to say. So that's that's what I would request. All right, well that that's a very fair and special request. So Jill Sankar, thank you again for being with us. Dr. Mazin Damashki, final thoughts, final thoughts. Uh, well, uh, my final thoughts are is that um, while IBM still remains the challenge, I'm just gratified to the fact that there's a strong industry uh, interest in finding a treatment for IBM. There's a foundation called the Myositis Association that's very supportive of IBM. As a matter of fact, some of our funding comes from TMA, the Myositis Association. Our partnership with the community of patients with IBM who have actively participated in our research studies, we're very grateful to that. So we'll continue on this path and hopefully one day we'll be able to say, now we've changed the disease course and we can help people with IBM. That's the ultimate goal, to help improve the lives of people suffering from IBM. Thank you. Well, thank you and thanks for being on this program. Doc Hawk, final thoughts. Yeah, you know, we've talked about uh, the triple-demic. Uh, you know, luckily, I think we seem to see the RSV cases going down, but just as we mentioned, you know, influenza and COVID is still out there and probably surging for COVID, and we know it's surging for influenza. Uh, it's never too late to get vaccinated. Really should have been done a month ago, but if you haven't been vaccinated, please go get vaccinated for influenza and get updated with your COVID booster if you meet that criteria. 
You know, the story of science is, um, it's an interesting one. It's also, um, it's a deeply personal one, right? It's a deeply personal one because we each have our own personal journey, our own challenges, and diseases do manifest a little differently in each individual because of our own respective genetic makeup um, and our own respective lives. It is though the power of science to help us on that deeply personal journey of how we encounter disease and illness. And we want to thank people like Jill Sankar for coming up and talking about their program, but also being a part of research. You know, science isn't made up, it shouldn't be. Uh, science is powerful when it helps lead to amazing things like vaccinations and new cures and therapies. And I've been privileged in my life to witness the advance of science in cystic fibrosis and watching people who would have died now living such long lives. Uh, but the journey for a patient is deeply personal. But all of us together can make a big difference. And that helps makes that personal journey so much more when we respect the journey, we understand it, but we use the power of science to help lift us up. Just back to you. Very well said, Dr. Seitz, thank you. And I just wanted uh, folks to know if you're watching on Facebook, we did cut out a bit during this program, and so we will have a full version of Open Mics posted a little bit later on this morning, so be on the lookout for that. Again, thanks to all of our guests today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be back tomorrow at eight for another morning medical update. Until then, have a great day. Coming up tomorrow on the morning medical update. You know about RSV, flu, COVID, and AIDS, but do you know about the other infectious diseases that keep doctors up at night? I'm Jessica Lovell. On Thursday, our panel of ID docs talk about emerging diseases that world experts are watching. Plus, it's World AIDS Day. We meet an HIV positive man who's trying to break down stereotypes and stigmas. See you at eight. I'm Alexis Del Cid, next on All Things Heart. I didn't realize how bad I was. The first thing his doctor asked him, how are you still alive? Why his doctor says he wasn't about to let age stop him from getting a new heart, Thursday morning at 10. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.